I, I mean, I honestly, I think this is the timeline we needed because otherwise, could you imagine the X Men movie? Just Beast a giant just orgy starts, in the middle of it. Beast just tears people apart and starts eating their insides. Like, I mean, that's kind of rad, honestly. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of I Finally Watched. I'm Alan, and I finally watched Event Horizon. And I'm David, and I also finally watched Event Horizon. How you doing today, buddy? After watching this? Eh, just in general. <laughs> Good. Good. Uh, I, uh, I kind of forced you to watch this. Uh, I kind of forced us to make an episode about this because it is Event Horizon's 25th anniversary this year and kind of fit perfectly with our sci-fi horror theme um, that we are ending with this one. Um, But I knew going into this that this was not a very good film. But, you know... I uh, I had my reasons. My reasons were sci-fi, horror, and 25th anniversary. And pretty much it began and ended there. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll give my thoughts on it, but first, first I want to hear yours. Um, is craptacular a word? Are you reading a review from 25 years ago? No. I, um... I don't know, man. It starts really bad. Um, there, I don't. I guess I honestly didn't really understand. Like, when you have like a scary horror movie, I think in order for it to be successful, you need to be scared of whatever the it is. And that is, I think, where the movie fails. Is I don't, re- I didn't know what I was supposed to be scared of. Mm. I mean, because if Sam Neill is what I'm supposed to be scared of, come on. Um, (laughs) But it's like it had some good stuff in it. You know what it really reminded me of? And as a kid, it was a movie I couldn't even watch. Um, And this movie wasn't I mean, the like the original version of this movie is probably a movie that I wouldn't have been able to handle at that age. But this reminded me of 13 Ghosts. Oh, yeah. I rented 13 ghosts from blockbuster when i was staying at my grandma's house i got her to fill out the blockbuster application and i checked the box that said i could rate uh rent rated our movies without like parental super you know from then on i could rent whatever i wanted and i rented a bunch of stuff while i like stayed with her and one of them was 13 ghosts and i got like 10 15 minutes in and i was just like not for me <laughs> and they turned it off and tur- returned it the next day um th- that like that's what this vibe felt like. I mean, and all of those horror movies around the same time, like with the house on haunted Hill or whatever, like ghost ship came out. Ghost ship. Yeah. I mean, all of those kind of had that same feel and that's what this felt like too. But also with like some weird choices that I think definitely dates the movie to like the late nineties. So, so, uh, and and this is something we get into all the time and then I'll, I'll give it back to you. But like, I'm curious more than most films what I would have thought of if I had watched this in 1997, like when I was 10 years old, if this is a movie I would have liked more because watching it now, especially being forced to watch it and choosing this over Friday the 13th. So now we got to wait another year for Friday the 13th. Don't tell people that. Maybe I wasn't in the best frame of mind putting this on. Um but I think maybe I would have liked it more had I watched it, you know, 20 years ago. Um, yeah, you know, when I was watching it, I was making more, I was making it more of a comparison with um, Sunshine. Um, obviously, Sunshine is a better film in, in all aspects of, of um, cinema. But now that you say 13 Ghosts, it's kind of like a mashup between 13 Ghosts and Sunshine, really. Um, you know, especially with the whole, like the crew is corrupted in the last voyage and now the new crew has to. So in, in that kind of way, sunshine is, is a lot of the same. Um, but (laughs) yeah, is Sam Neill, the guy you're supposed to be the entity you're supposed to be scared of the whole time. 
So one thing you said that I completely agree with is what exactly is happening? Who is our villain and and why are we supposed to be scared of them? And the first thing is that um, that happens is in the movie is very similar to what happens in Alien where um, <laughs> it's funny to actually now that I'm thinking about this out loud, it's like um, it's like 2001 where you meet the crew and they're like going into cryo freeze and then alien where they're coming out of cryo freeze. And then of course this movie has its whole thing with cryo freeze. It's like space horror loves cryo hibernation. Right. Um, so they're, uh, they are selected for the mission. And then Sam Neill, of course, is kind of like, uh, Ridley in this situation where doesn't quite fit in with the like the macho-ness of everyone from Aliens. I said Ridley again. Three episodes in a row and this isn't even about Aliens. Shut up. Ripley. Uh, Ripley is kind of different from all the macho uh, soldiers from, from Aliens. Right? Sam Neill is different from this crew. And again, the crew is in the dark for what they're actually doing. Um but they are almost instead of being like one entity, like one alien or multiple aliens, um, or HAL nine thousand, these guys are kind of tormented within their own minds, and and we as the audience don't really know where that's coming from. One thing that I want to talk about is Sam Neil keeps seeing his dead wife. I presume yeah. that it's her. Um, he even sees her before they even get close to the planet that, um, or the, the ship that they're supposed to be rescuing. But then he sees her again, once he's on the ship that they're supposed to be rescuing. The questions to me is that, is that already part of like the infection, like the, the mind fuckery of it? Or is that his own thing going on? But the problem with the movie is that it's probably his own thing going on in the first time it happens to him. And it's probably the mindfuckery of, of what happens on the ship. But the movie doesn't make any distinction of the difference between that. So you as the audience member still don't know what is happening until maybe like. Until maybe the thing, uh, the the black hole engine turns on and then maybe everyone is like oh okay it's from that thing but other than that it's like you kind of just don't know what the hell is going on through the whole movie which i kind of like in a movie i've mentioned before that i like when a movie doesn't spoon feed you every detail um, but i think this might be a little on the extreme side well and the other the other issue with this and you compare it to sunshine what is what sunshine had going for it is and i guess it had the same thing in sunshine i was thinking like oh in sunshine you had this other entity that's the bad guy so he could have attacked at any moment but really what sunshine the first half of sunshine or whatever is just kind of a a space sci-fi movie that then turns into a horror movie and i guess that's what this is too but it's just like the whole time you're like okay something's up with sam neil um, I don't know exactly know what, and I guess you're supposed to figure that the, the ship is affecting him and he maybe wants to be affected by it too, because like he chose to go on this. And then when they're all going to the ship, he's like, I want to go to the ship. I thought that his wife was on this ship. Mm. Like she was one of the old crew. That's what I thought we were getting at here. And then it's just like, no, she killed herself because i guess he was just gone on space mi missions too much is what we're supposed to gather i think yeah the longer version might have explained that better um but like so until sam neil turns bad you realize like nothing bad can really happen to anyone unless they walk into that black hole um but it, we never get a good explanation of why Sam Neill is like affected by this and attracted to it. Like that backstory, you, you uh, need a vil you need a villain speech explaining that. Yeah, but but still without it being too like expository. Um, 
Well, no, in the end, I would have just in the end when he's in the room with um, Lawrence Fishburne Miller. Yeah. If he explains it, then his master stroke or whatever that I think would have made it better, but it's still just like, it's, it's just feels so unconnected. Well, yeah. I mean, this is an hour and a half movie almost on, on the dot. Right. And how this whole thing is kind of divided up is that the first 30 minutes is the setup. And then the last hour is the stuff happening. Right. Right. Um, but no one dies until like an hour, like 20, like then every, like everyone starts dropping like flies in the last 20 minutes of the movie. But even, um, the first kid, (laughs) the first kid, the, the, I forgot his name. Do you know, do you remember his name? Justin. Right. Uh, everyone has such cool names and alien and aliens and this fucking kid's called Justin, but whatever. I mean, um, Stark, Coop, Smitty, DJ, someone's named Killpack. I don't know who the fuck. I think that's someone on the previous ship. There's some cool names. Okay. Okay. Well, um, when you said Coop, I thought you were talking about Interstellar for a second. I was like, oh, you're going all the way back there, huh? Um, No, but, but so Justin, you know, the entity has tried to kill Justin like two, three times during this whole thing. And Justin just won't fucking die um so no one dies until like everyone starts dying in the end thanks to sam neil which is also a strange sentence to say because we know him most famously from jurassic park the the archaeologist and the only thing in that movie that's being scared of is the the dinosaurs and so you know he's almost in a position to be the main character the guy we're like see his point of view on um the guy we're cheering for and then all of a sudden lawrence fishburne is kind of like fits into that role where i thought he was going to be the villain so in that turn that was kind of an ambitious cool twist but it just wasn't well executed there's a lot of really good things going on here there's a there's some things that could have been really good and cool but none of it was followed through very well yeah, I mean, I never thought Larry Fish was going to be the bad guy. He's like, it's also Morpheus. like, he looks so different two years later as Morpheus with the shaved head. He looks huge in that, and he looks so, like, kind of, not frail, but he looks tiny in this, like, very skinny. Like, he looks so much younger um, in two years. And there's also the point where he's, like, sitting in the the captain's chair almost makes him look like he was, like, paraplegic like the way he sat in it it felt like he was like had issues with his legs like because you first like one of the first times you see him in that and i was like no i've already seen him walk um the the other thing from this is funny so like the connection to the movies we've just recently done but like the ship design for the event horizon is so much like 2001 so much like sunshine which followed that and then sam neill's explanation of how they travel faster than light which is funny too because like when we talked about interstellar the the scientist involved was like you can't travel faster than light that's impossible and so in this movie when they're like oh well you know how we can't travel faster than light well we found a way around it was like you can't do that and then he explains it i was like oh that's how interstellar does it (laughs) they create like a worm you know use a black hole create a wormhole um and you know even the piece of paper folding thing, right? Um, I I cannot count how many things I've used that piece of paper folding example. Uh, the first time that the, the first thing that comes to mind is Stranger Things, when the <laughs> when the professor is trying to explain the upside down, and he's like, "Yeah, if you take this piece of paper and imagine a fly on a tightrope, and you fold, and then he pokes the pin through." And I'm like, "Oh my god, that's well, that's in, not in- like a trope." In your life, the first thing to do it was Stranger Things. That's the first one you saw. But for everyone else, that was last. <laughs> yeah, I guess since they're supposed to be set in the 80s, that's like perfectly fine for them. Um, it's when, let's, when uh, everyone else uses these. Let's get these started with this and run, and run through it. I um, The opening, and a lot of this movie felt this way too, but the opening felt like a like a twilight zone episode 
like that was stretched into a movie like the music and then just like it was twi- it, to me it was like twilight zone house music and i was like mm-hmm. immediately like i kind of regret that we're doing this you have to remind me of the opening i'm i'm forgetting it's just the title sequence but it's like a twilighty zone oh just oh you're talking music. about the title okay. yeah um and then we immediately get sam neil on the ship and we get like apparently half the like a third or half of the CGI budget was just on the ship that Sam Neill's on and like the spinning that it was doing. And I was like, first of all, that almost made me sick. I was like, and second of all, it doesn't look great 25 years later. Also, um, that ship design is horrible. Like everyone is in a separate pod, like away from each other. Like, do they have to climb those scaffolding things in space to get to the other pods? I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm I'm not sure. Um, so then we're immediately on the Lewis and Clark for a top secret mission uh, going to Neptune and Sam Neill joins. And then they're immediately put into these cryo tanks, basically, because I guess there were going to be um, they'll be liquefied if they don't. Uh, so I guess it's also for the length of the journey and like, you know, you're going to get your brain or maybe they just go really fast. I don't know. But yeah, so they get put in tanks and then they're out of the tank. Um, I guess it's been 56 days, but it lasted two seconds. Yep. I and that's when that we get that's when we first, get Sam Neill's. Yeah. Which is like they're close to Neptune now. So maybe like, I don't know. Yeah, his connection to the ship to the event horizon once again is like. Who knows? You know, what's what's well, the, he built it. He he invented that little black hole little but he invented that that black hole machine. So that's his connection. I'm talking about why he's, you know, the spiritual connection he has where he's seeing his dead wife. He's the most mentally tormented for, out of everyone. I'm not asking for guesses from you. I'm just saying it's not explained. <laughs> okay. Um, and then, of course, we start meeting the crew. We uh, we meet. I don't know any of their names. They're not well, as... Me- Peter's is the one with the sun, and we're only told she has a son because we're going to see the sun later on. Yeah. Um, and then this is when we finally get. Before this, they didn't know what the mission was, and so Sam Neill explains like that the Event Horizon was using basically a black hole to go farther than they ever could, and um, it was a lie that it blew up. So now we're going to go get it. Um. And he's like, basically, look, there's a distress call coming out, um, which is interesting. We don't get any explanation about why that was put out. Maybe the ship itself put it out? I thought that. I thought it was the ship itself. Oh, and then they, so they get there, right? And Sam Neill, is it Sam Neill plays them this, uh, Sam Neill plays them the the video clip, right? And I guess this makes more sense when you realize that Sam Neill's not like the best person in this movie. But they play a video clip and DJ's immediately like, oh, that's Latin. It means save, save us. And I was like, yeah. no one else, no one else knew Latin before this. Like DJ's the only one in the universe who still knows it. Let's, let's talk about DJ played by Jason Isaacs for a second. Um, did you think he was going to be the villain? No, no. Yeah. No, I think, no, no, no. I didn't think so. I, um, I mean, he doesn't always play the villain. We've done one movie where he's, you know. And then you got Harry Potter. He he does other things. He's the villain in Harry Potter. I know. I said, and then Harry Potter. Oh, well, I mean, I saw Jason Isaacs and I thought he was going to be the villain. I mean, I, I thought he was going to be the villain more than I thought fucking Sam Neill was going to be the villain. I, I mean, I didn't know what was going to happen. Just Sam Neill kept acting so weird. That's like, as it's going on, he's just like not... And the camera is showing him, right? Like no one else in the ship is seeing it, but like the dramatic irony that we know he's becoming the bad guy and the and the crew doesn't. Yeah. Um I also like when they pop up the the Lewis and Clark, which is oh so so coolly named the Lewis and Clark, comes up on the ship. It just they come up to the part that says event horizon, so it's just like, okay, I guess we, we know we're here. Yeah, yeah. And this is also also too like in this part the, the and this happens throughout the movie but it's definitely the beginning in this part the music is so like overbearing 
uh, to the movie. It's like in your face. And like, that's part of that. I just didn't enjoy was like the, the music choices mostly. It's like, it's really nineties, I guess. It's very nineties. The, the, the title sequence with the music reminded me of blade <laughs> with the, dun, 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 you know, like the club music from blade, which doesn't really fit like the horror space theme that we're trying to, you know, say here. Um, and then, all right, so let's talk about the rest of the crew. You talked about Peter's uh, Lieutenant Stark, right? Who was kind of in a position to be maybe like a main character, but then you don't see her for like a whole third of the movie. There's like a third of the movie where you know she's alive. She's one of the only ones alive. And then she's just gone for that whole part of it. Um, and we have Cooper and we have Smith. And as soon as I saw Smith, I was like, that motherfucker is Alfred from the Gotham TV show. And I have never seen him in anything else other than this and Gotham. Um, and then, yeah, we already talked about Justin. So that's the crew, uh, the Motley crew. And uh, they go to explore the event horizon and, and then shit happens. Do you know what movie we have done that Stark, played by Julie Richardson, has been in? No. Uh, the Patriot with Jason Isaacs. Oh, she's, was like, she, was she, she's like Mel Gibson's like love interest. She get burned in the church? No, no, that's a different girl. She's the one oh. that ends up with Mel Gibson, who I think lives in, in the Patriot. Spoiler alert. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, so yeah, she disappears for like the end of the like for most of the end of the movie, and I was like, at one point, where where has she gone? And then she just shows up, passed out, and I guess in the, the original cut of this movie is like in two hours ten minutes, so about thirty to forty minutes longer than what we got. And I guess there's a part where Weir chases her, and she falls down a ladder and knocks herself out, and then when we find her she's in a room with Weir and like, that's when like the, the showdown happens, which is one of the most, like the scenes I want to talk about the most for when we get to it. Um, but so yeah, she just disappears for quite a bit. Um, and that is just because of the, the editing that had to be done on the movie. Yeah. Okay. Well still, I mean, just why, why did they have to cut a two hour, 10 minute movie to down to one thirty? Like most movies are, around two hours well let's talk about that now so um there is a scene uh towards the end of the movie that uh, basically a short synopsis of this movie is that this ship that used the black hole instead of going to the farthest reaches of the universe went out of our universe and went to hell and the crew finds a video of the old crew basically partying in hell and so when I watched this, it's like 10, 15 seconds. And I was like, what the fuck did I watch? I was like, it, I was like, it was porn, but it was like cannibalism. So I went back, you know, for you, the listeners, to, to go and look at each little bit of it to see what the fuck is going on. And there is definitely some hardcore sex. There's some stuff spewing out of an orifice. There is like some dude holding his own eyeballs, it looks like. Um there's a woman doing something to a man and then there's a, a threesome going on. It it's just for the little bit pretty horrifying. And so the, the original version of this movie had a much longer scene where you could see all of this, like all of it. And there was like a woman who was getting uh, nails uh, drove into her teeth there was a person whose legs were being hammered and they were crawling away as their legs separated from them. There was someone who got their arm chopped off. Um, just a dude who gets a spike in the back of the head, just like craziness. And apparently when they tested this movie, people passed out. Oh my and the, God. And the studio was like, we wanted a summer blockbuster. What the fuck is this? And so who, who directed this? Uh, Paul Anderson, Paul W.S. Anderson, who has directed uh, Mortal Kombat, 
and he directed um, the Resident Evil movies is what I think a lot of people know him from. Hmm. Um, so he actually chose, instead of doing um, the sequel to Mortal Kombat, he decided to do uh, this movie. Um, and there was a couple other things he gave up on doing so that he could do this. He... It- yeah. He was hold on, he was going to be the director of either X-Men, the original X-Men movie, the X-Files movie, or Alien Resurrection, and he had to give up all three of those in order to do this. Well, I hope it was worth it. I I mean, I honestly I think this is the timeline we needed cuz otherwise, could you imagine the X-Men movie? Just Beast a giant just starts, orgy in the middle of it. Beast just tears people apart and starts eating their insides. Like, I mean, that's kind of rad, honestly. Um, what What's so crazy about this is that watching this movie and as you're like, okay, this is a sci-fi set in space and there are horror elements to it. And you know it's coming from this black hole, but you're just as in the dark as the rest of the crew as to like, you don't know immediately that this ship went to hell. Like, it's not hell, right? Not like a religious aspect of hell. It's like a part of the universe that would be perceived as we would perceive hell, right? I think it's it's supposed to be hell. But it's like other dimension worthy, right? Like that, this, this black hole took them to a bad place. And um, where, where fucking Pinhead and his crew live. Um, the thing with that is that I don't think we understand that until Sam Neill comes back with, no, you know what? I'll tell you when we understand it. We, we understand it when Jason Isaacs is hooked up by like fishing hooks and gutted and then uh, demonic symbols are written in his blood on the, uh, the wind windshields of the ship. Uh, I think that's when we know Satan is involved because, because the only thing as demonic as I've ever seen that is in Midsommar when very similarly something happens to a person in that film like that. And um and so then at least you know you're in some sort of cult or demon occult. Um, but you don't really understand that it's hell until you see that videotape of the orgy thing that we were talking about. There was also a woman who was being raped and then had one of her breasts just torn off. Where's the budget for all this, though? So apparently... <laughs> The way he filmed this was he used real porn stars and people <laughs> and amputees. No. And he just filmed it on weekends and like he prepped it out for months and then he took like a week to shoot it on weekends is what you know I read in various spots. Um, yeah. And just the studio did had no idea that this was coming. And, and the thing is, it's like I read I read some comments. And people are like, oh, I really wish I could see that version. And I was like, that doesn't make it a better movie, right? That makes it maybe those, stick. Those people just want to watch torture porn. I mean, maybe it sticks with you a little bit more, right? Um, but it's like that doesn't solve the issues with this movie to me. Um, what's So what's interesting is this movie was obviously cut. And... Um, afterwards, like the studio was like, yeah, you know what? Eventually maybe you should just release the full version, but this was like before DVD. So it's like, they've, a lot of the footage was lost and it's like all on VHS. And so apparently like part of the footage they found in like a Transylvanian mine, which is like something I read, but doesn't even sound like it's possibly real. And then like, what? Uh, I think as of like 2017, I read that Paul W. S. Anderson and like the maybe the cinematographer like had a VHS copy of the full thing, but like they hadn't sat down to watch it yet. And so it's just it's one of those things. It's like probably never going to make it. Um, if it didn't come out for the 25th anniversary, I mean, what chance do we have, right? So 
Uh, it might be one of those things where it's good that it never sees the light of day. Um, yeah. So I don't even I don't even know how to jump back into about this movie. <laughs> I'll I'll do it for you. So I mean, okay. the middle forty minutes of this movie is basically like hallucinations and bad shit happening to the ship, and mostly involving justin right so it's like mm-hmm. peters hallucinates her son and apparently you know you see like his legs are fucked up and he's got maggots coming out of them apparently it was so much more vile in the original but the director paul ws anderson was like it was so bad it like took you out of the movie so we had to tone that down so he made that decision on his own apparently wow. um so we have that the knows, uh the guy knows restraint <laughs> i guess so then justin goes into the core and comes out and this is like your first sign too that that Weir is um is something's wrong with him because Cooper's like I went in after him he went in the core I saw it it was like liquidy and Weir's like ah it's bullshit that's not true but then he explains like okay if what he saw was real this is what it would have been and you're like well that's exactly what it was and what's what's cool about the Lawrence Fishburne character is he is like the you always have to have this in the space movie like the most logical leader dude who's like, okay, well then that's what it is. And he smells Sam Neill's bullshit from the jump. Like he understands like, okay, this is, I can't trust this guy. Um, And then you, you know, you have like more hallucinations, but you have a scene where like Smith from the beginning, like hates the ship and wants to get off. He attacks Weir and then DJ like puts a knife to Smith's throat. And DJ's me like, oh, fuck, what's going on here? You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Like, uh, it's just a bunch of this happening until, um, oh, yeah, there's also the banging on the door and Weir goes to open it and Stark stops him. Yep. And then we get to the airlock scene with Justin, which is kind of like the next major thing. You know, he's talked about how, like, he sees the dark coming. He keeps saying things like that. And you're like, so you know something's bad in that gate. But then, like... You don't know, obviously, like we said, you don't know it's hell until later. But yeah, he tries to get out of the airlock um, and they have to save him. So before we get there, we have Justin in like a comatose state in the med bay for a while. And Peters is down there and that's when she sees her son. I think the med bay is actually some of the coolest, most suspenseful scenes Especially when Peters is walking back and forth and then like you see Justin laying on the table behind her and then as she walks past him, she doesn't notice it, but the table's empty, right? So that's yeah. when he's like he's like in the airlock. Um, I guess he's like possessed or semi possessed. Um but all the scenes that happen in the med bay are super suspenseful. Um, I also want to talk about when they want to go down there, uh, Miller, right? Lawrence Fishburne's character and Sam Neill's character go down to the black hole engine. And Sam Neill like crawls in a crawl space. The like all the microchip, the green microchips with the with the lights emulating. That was a really cool set. Um, I thought I thought I was really like sci-fi looking and really practical and that's where he gets like a huge hallucination about his wife i think she was she was either bleeding from the eyes or she doesn't have eyes something like that who's sam neil yeah sam neil's wife well i think i mean she killed herself in a bathtub is what we end up finding out yeah we find out through there and then at the same time that that's going on and he's hallucinating that lawrence fishburne is outside hallucinating one of his like our uh, army guys that he um, kind of left to die, uh, like emerges from the watery substance of the ship and is like on fire. And then he was saying that it wasn't just a hallucination because he could feel the heat. So obviously the ship is messing with them in all these sorts of ways that um, no one could possibly know about their lives, right? Like Sam Neill has told no one on the ship about his wife. Lawrence Fishburne told no one about his um, army days. So uh, the, the ship is like getting into their subconscious and then taking these things out from their minds. Yet as the audience, 
you still don't know what the hell is really going on. Yeah, so because after, you know, Lawrence Fishburne saves Justin, brings him back in, but we also once again get a, a guy getting shot out of like into space, but like surviving for a couple seconds, which is yeah, you know, totally like a, a, a 2001 thing. Um, and then, yeah, so we get that scene when they're in the, I don't even remember why the fuck they went in there, um, but they went in there to check it out, I guess. They come back and they come back out and this is when, Lawrence Fishburne explains that the guy he saw was Eddie. Um, and it's this is basically his motivation for the rest of the movie. This that this movie turns into from a horror movie into like a uh like a character arc action movie at one point, uh like a drama. Um it's got like all of that going on. Uh yeah. and you know, because he explains like, oh, I couldn't save Eddie, but I left him and I've never left a crew member since, and he burned alive. But then DJ comes in with like, and this is kind of when the movie turns because he's like, you know, the the recording wasn't save me. It was save yourself from hell. And that's like the first time I think we heard the word hell mentioned with like in connection to this movie. Um, And so from there, I think is the turn because we get right after this, we get the... uh, we get the um the video right <laughs> which the way it's introduced is like most of the crew is out trying to fix the lewis and clark because they none of them want to stay on the ship and then peters and stark are working on the video and then they get it to work and you just see their like horror and disgust right and then we get to see the little bit of it that we get to see yeah which is like through like a crack screen with a bunch of static i mean we hardly even get to see it um yeah and so cooper right cooper is a character in this movie and he's been kind of mia through the whole movie because he's outside the ship fixing the hull of of uh lewis and clark and so he's busy doing that while everyone is basically getting their minds violated and um What's interesting, too, is that I guess you then kind of start figuring out, right, is is who is the villain and the villain outside of it just being Sam Neill, because I don't think it's Sam Neill initially. Right. It's it's it is the ship. The event horizon went to the hell dimension. And when it came back, it brought something back with it. Right. Like it brought a demon or maybe a couple of demons it's not a Along. demon. It's just like it's like an aura, I guess, because she says there's life everywhere on the ship. So, ghost ship. I mean, it's really ghost ship. It's ghost ship. It's ghost ship in space. Yeah. No, no, no. But I mean, like demon in like the metaphorical sense. Like, what is a demon? Right. It's not like a flesh and blood. Well, if you meant it metaphorically, you wouldn't have said a couple demons. <laughs> One big ass demon. Um. Anyways, so this thing that that came back with the ship when it was transported back to Neptune. Um, that is what's really torturing them and getting in their heads. And then Sam Neill gets the full brunt of that when I feel like he's the one that's like possessed because he's the one that kills DJ. He's the one that kills um, or that attempts to kill uh, Lawrence Fishburne and Stark um but for peters peters i think before sam neil got fully possessed peters in her mind sees her son running around the ship which stupid right wouldn't you know that it's not really your son like you're a couple you know however many light years away from earth and you left your son on earth but i love the way that tricks her into like falling down the shaft and then just dying yeah yeah i um what's weird about this to me is so right before this weir reveals himself as like the evil character that he is because he says the sh- he's like the ship's not gonna let you leave because lawrence fisher is like we're getting the fuck out of here and he's like no the ship's not gonna let you leave and he gives this like evil smile and then runs off um so then Peters dies in the core and Sam Neill runs in and he sees her and he's like, Oh, Peters. Oh my gosh. And like goes to her side and you're like, all right, well that feels like some continuity, like some cutting that was done wrong because 
he just showed himself as evil, but then he cares about Peter's dying. Um, but that's why I'm saying it's some sort of possession. Maybe he's still like fighting it, right? There's some sort of conflict within him that it's like, is it a hundred percent the demon, or is it fifty percent the demon, fifty percent him? And then by the by the climax of the movie, it's a hundred percent the demon. I think it's a hundred percent bad writing and editing is what causes that. Well, do you agree that throughout this film there are some good ideas, some good moments, but just not executed very well? Yeah, yeah, here and there. Um, I th- but overall just having like a demon ship is um it's it's like it's hard to be scared of and then you're like all right well let me just put a bunch of shocking horrible images in there to like drive home the horror aspect of it is not it's not a thing that like works for me you know what i mean like just disgusting stuff is not my thing so i i almost feel like you what they what they did put in there as far as disgusting stuff was like blase and it didn't like make the impact that maybe they initially wanted to make so i'm either like don't go in that direction at all or they should have gone harder in that direction toward the end um well, yeah and that, i mean but, that's what the i think that's what the after the fact you realize oh we we kind of fucked up by making you cut it this way um so Weir is in there with Peters and then he looks up and his wife is there and she basically just fucking stabs his eyes out. Right. And you're like, oh, yeah. okay. And then a second later it cuts to Weir being on the Lewis and Clark and uh, Lawrence Fishburne's like, Oh, Smitty, he's put a bomb on there. Get off. And Smitty's like, I'm not getting off. I'll find the bomb. And he finds it, but just not enough time to do anything about it. And so it blows up, it throws Coop, and I'm like, oh, did that kill Coop? And then a second later, it's like, no, he's just floating. He'll be back. He's gonna. Yeah, he Coop. basically did. He did the Martian, where he like shoots his air to like throw him back. Coop, Cooper uh, is actually a really cool character. I think like he he he's given nothing to do through the whole movie, and then at the end, where you think he like spends all this time fixing the ship, all for not, and he comes back with like rage right he's like what the hell man he comes back in his little jetpack thing um to basically save the day at least he helps like trying trying to save the day um and then we have weir sam neil coming into like the cockpit he's all well, scarred you, up he has his eyes you, back yeah you talked about that but i do think you talked about DJ's death and like the aftermath of it. But what I thought was interesting is the parts we did get to see before the ending. Cause once again, this seems like something that was cut for like content. Like this was, I think this first originally got a, like an NC 17 rating. So they had to take a lot out, but DJ is told by Lawrence Fishburne, Oh, you need to get weird. And so like we, DJ has kind of been established a little bit as like a badass. So he picks up a knife but Weir's just behind him and now has super strength right. and just tosses him around and then cuts him open. And I guess in the original version of this, when Lawrence Fishburne finds him, which by the way, Lawrence Fishburne hears this going on, runs down to the med bay. And in this time, there's been like a perfect dissection of DJ and him hung up with all these needles. Like, why did it take him so long to get there? Like that part didn't really make any sense. But in the original version... DJ is apparently still alive and hanging there alive. And Lawrence Fishburne has to like shoot him in the head with the gun he grabs to like end it for him. Jesus. Um, Yeah. So, but then he goes after Weir. He finds him in the cockpit. We find Stark. I was like, where the fuck have you been? And then he looks and his gun has been taken. Um, This is when basically Sam Neill is given some of the, coldest slash corniest lines in the movie starting with a direct rip when he's like where we're going we won't need eyes <laughs> i thought i thought that too i thought that I was like okay man what the hell and then you wanted to you wanted to know where this ship went i'll show you um 
But he did get his eyes back. Like in the last time we see him, he has his eyes back. No explanation. Well, yeah, because so he's sitting there. He has Stark. Stark attacks him. He throws her. She's completely ragdolled and like, you know, knocked out. And then he points the gun at Lawrence Fishburne. Lawrence Fishburne is like, oh, yeah. And then Coop comes in. Lawrence Fishburne's like, if you miss, you'll blow the airlock and uh, or you, you know, you'll blow the pressure. And he's like, what makes you think I can possibly miss? And then he sees Coop and shoots out the window. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, I know. And then as they're being sucked out, the pressure of this is crazy. Like you feel like in other movies you've seen, it would have equalized quicker than this. And so somehow with his super strength, he's hanging onto this metal that is ripping off of the ship and eventually takes him out and throws him out. But somehow Lawrence Fishburne can hold on. And somehow Stark who is completely passed out, just remains in there. And we get this hero moment where he like doesn't let the door shut and he grabs Stark and takes her out. I thought it was going to split Stark in half. I thought the door was going to go and just cut her in half. Because the tone for this movie is so weird too. Like you think it's not going to go real gory. And then you see a scene like DJ. Which now that you said your thing about that scene, we know it could have been more gory. Um, but but you don't really know like the tonal shifts of this movie. Is it going to cut a person in half and have their entrails, you know, following, or is everything going to be perfectly fine? Um, one thing that I wanted to talk about is happened at the beginning of this movie. Well, like maybe thirty minutes in, when they first board the Event Horizon. They explain that this corridor within the ship has bombs alongside it. And those bombs are there that if something were to go wrong with the engine or vice versa, they can separate the ship with the lab. Those bombs would explode, uh, blowing up the corridor and and doing just that. So these bombs are are introduced. And uh, I'm like, well, obviously that's going to come into play at the climax of this movie. And Sam Neill uses one of those bombs to blow up a a different part of the ship. But then we have this whole like 10 minute thing where Lawrence Fishburne has to go into that corridor and rig the bombs to do just that. But so much stuff happens that I don't think that ever actually gets. He separates the ship, but he like Stark and, and, and the other people are safe and he's like, he blows himself on the other half of the, with the uh, black hole engine, right? Yeah, he kills himself, basically to save them. Although he actually probably, I think, got sent to hell. He blew up the middle, and I think the black hole part of it probably still sent. But I don't know. It was pretty fucking big explosion. Um, well, it's also weird because he's he's in that room with Sam Neill. Sam Neill is kind of they're they're fighting. And then he shows him what hell is. And then even the people who have died, like Jason Isaac's character, he's like, they're still alive. They're just in that other dimension or like whatever that means. Right. Like Because it's like, supposed to be hell. <laughs> I, but they gutted Jason Isaacs and killed Justin. And they're still like, oh, they're still there. But then he's like, I'm going to take care of this. And he blows the whole thing to hell. (laughs) Not intended for it. But he blows up the whole thing, uh, thinking like, oh, if he takes this out, then he's basically saving their damned souls. But I don't understand that either. No, he's not. He's saving Stark and Cooper and Justin. Okay, so he's just... He's just saving... saving, Yeah, he's saving those three because it's at least he can do, right? I mean, it's the whole point of him of us hearing about the story about eddie and about how he doesn't lose any crew members anymore he won't leave anybody behind so that's why he does it. it's not to save anybody else it's um but yeah you kind of you kind of fast forward through this but i didn't want to talk about it like there's a scene where stark and um lawrence fishburne are looking at the airlock and we're like supposed to think it's weird and it's like of course it's not weird right and so it's cooper and they decide to blow the ship up and then the ship starts making them hallucinate so you're like that's what's going to stop them Because, no, Weir's dead. And then somehow Weir comes back, which is fucking crazy. 
Right. It makes no sense. And then he spits the line, hell is only a word. Reality is much worse. And then that's when he, I think, starts showing Lawrence Fishburne all these visions. And then it turns into a bad fight. <laughs> like, yeah, this turns into a fight, fight movie. Um, and Lawrence Fishburne blows up the ship to save the clue, that saved the crew. Um, and this is, yeah, I was like, does that send him to hell, right? Because it's, I think Sam Neill designed the ship not to blow up that core because that blowing up a black hole creating core probably has some consequences for the universe. So it's like maybe just separate it off. Um, and at this point I had this thought because the way Stark looks back at Miller and, you know, after he saved her life, I was like, I mean, very clearly Stark was going to fuck Lawrence Fishburne. And apparently a uh, cut from the extended edition of this was some backstory where they had previously gotten it on. So my summation wow. was correct. Wow. So then we get to the end and like the very end, Stark, Cooper, Justin, they're all in their cryo freeze and they get rescued, but not without one more fake out. Did you think this was like, so I felt like the demon or Sam Neill possessed by the demon is still on the ship, right? Because she gets like nightmare mode freaked out by Sam Neill coming back one last time and, and, and killing her. And then she wakes up. You can't see me, but I'm putting air quotes. She wakes up, uh, actually wakes up to an actual rescue rescue crew saving them. But then the doors just automatically ominously close behind them. And then that's the end of the movie. So I'm thinking like, are they now trapped on there with the rescue crew? Like, is the, the door just closing mean something? Or is that just a way to end the movie? It's just a way to end the movie. And the I felt the last scare was a hacky attempt at getting one final scare. And it didn't confuse me at all at any point. I was like, this is just going to be a real rescue. And she's freaking out for nothing. And I was like, there's no way. Um that was like, I was like, okay, wow, you really, really ended strong here, guy. Um, the, the, uh, the whole movie was rough, man. Um, but I'm glad we did it because I, I, we haven't, I don't know, the, the last few movies we've done have just been really, really good films. I mean, Top Gun, Interstellar, Alien Aliens. I think we needed something like this to be like, oh, wait, those good movies are actually really good in comparison to <laughs> a shitty sci-fi film. Now, I do want to give him the benefit of the doubt because there were other things cut from this movie that may have made it better, may have made it may more sense, more cohesive. Um, you know, it's 40 minutes. So it wasn't 40 minutes of debauchery in hell that was cut. You know I mean? That scene could have lasted only so long. Right. So I, I don't want to fully blame him, but I mean, despite what my wife thinks about Mortal Kombat, like I didn't like his first movie either. Um, and I also just think, man, like, he has such a distinct style and combining that distinct style with the nineties just doesn't age well. And so watching this 25 years later is not the first time you want to see this movie. It doesn't work for me. No, I, I agree. You know what I would like to see? And I mean this with all the sincerity is I would like to see a remake of this film. It couldn't even be directed by him again in like, you know, 2022. I think if he just like polishes it up a bit, I think you could actually have something genuinely scary. Um, so I'm I'm saying, yeah, it, it didn't work, but I think it calls for a remake. I'm 100 percent in uh, support of Event Horizon, the remake. So at one point 
and I don't know if this is still happening. Do you know who Adam Wingard is? I'm just going to keep talking. I do talking. know. Oh, you do? Who Adam Win- yeah, I do know. I gonna- so he was tapped to do a series remake of this. Um, it was being developed based on the movie and directed by him. And, you know, that stuff happens and then goes away. Right. Um, but I love the movie The Guest that he did. We're actually doing another movie of his, Your Next, uh, sometime during this here spooky season. Mm-hmm. Um, so that, if that ever happens, it's probably not going to happen anymore because who knows when that was originally supposed to happen. That would have been interesting. I just think, I think you have to change the story up a little bit. I just don't think as constructed, it's like, I don't think it works that well. I agree. I agree. You know, with Adam Wingard, he did uh, Godzilla versus Kong and uh, the the movies that you mentioned. Um, however, I don't like him because of his Death Note, Netflix, whatever the hell that was, um, and his uh, Blair Witch remake, I heard was not that good. So maybe, I don't know. He's not so good on adaptations and remakes. So maybe he should stick to more like original content. Well, except, you know, the original Death Note, the the Asian version, and then the, the anime, and the original Blair Witch were good. So maybe if he starts from the original Event Horizon, which is not good, then maybe his version would be good. Quite honestly, any version other than this version has a high possibility of being good. Yeah, and once again, you can't get... I mean, whenever... You know, we're going to do Aliens or Alien 3 next year. Um, and, you know, David Fincher is one of my favorite directors ever, right? And that movie is supposed to be a piece of garbage. When you have a studio get involved and make you completely cut up a movie and take 40 minutes out of it, If it's good, that's a miracle. So, um, you know, I don't want to just shit on him the whole time. But, yeah, this did not turn out great. So, well, thanks for listening to another episode of I Finally Watched. This is David. And this is Alon. And we finally watched Event Horizon.